The following is an edited recording from a live video broadcast. Image and audio quality may vary. Uh, myself and a whole bunch of dudes ran a convention uh, called Con 9 for Matter Space, and it was a one-off event. It was a weekend devoted solely to classic golden age cinema, movies, TV shows, and even radio plays uh, from back then. Uh, we had so obviously some people dressed in costumes. We had some displays and some robots and all the rest of it, So, which was absolutely fantastic. But the thing that we did, uh for the event um is that prior to the convention occurring we put the word out to all these people and we said okay name your top five sci-fi movies and we um got all those numbers together and we did a panel at the end of the convention discussing the top 20 right so this is what we're going to do tonight right so it's actually the top 20 classic uh sci-fi films just movies from before 1965 so believe it or not and now i'm going to mean even this surprised me number 20 right was in fact Quatermass 2. Now there's two Quatermasses. You've got Quatermass 2, which is II, and you've got Quatermass 2, the number two. Uh, and even though this says II, it is actually number two because the Quatermass II was the TV series, if that makes sense. And um, so they rushed this movie out, uh, Quatermass 2, after the success of the first film, The Quatermass Experiment. And as it turned out, uh, it overlapped with actually the TV series at the same time. And the actor they've got here, Brian uh, Don Levy, was the only time a person played Quatermass, uh, Bernard Quatermass, in two particular sort of reiterated the character in two different um, episodes, if you will. Because in, in the entire TV series, every time they produced the series, Quatermass, the character, was changed to a different person. And of course, Quater, Quater, Quatermass is the guy, by the way. And in the movies, it was the same. So it's the only time this guy played the character twice. And uh, so it was a highly successful movie at the time. Uh, it was all to do with aliens taking over the earth and all sort of bizarre, as you do in Britain. And uh, it was uh, quite successful. So I was actually surprised that this came up as number, number 20. I go, oh, really? I wouldn't have seen that because there are three movies. And I think there are like three TV series which are broken up in, into um, uh, episodes. And uh, as it turned out, um, they're all out and about, and you've got to check them out. So uh, there you go. Uh, in America, this was known as a different movie. This was called uh, The Enemy Something or Other Invades Us or Enemy from Space. So in America, they thought Quatermass wasn't going to sell any tickets, uh, and uh, so they changed the name. And as it turned out, uh, Brian um, Don Levy was an American because they wanted him to break into the American audience. So anyway, now this one, number 19, I thought, oh, I wouldn't have seen this at number 19. I would have thought this higher up the food chain. Can you guess what it is? And of course it is. <gasps> This Island Earth. We're talking about Metaluna mutants earlier on. Everybody loved a bit of This Island Earth. Uh, I've got to say, I was a bit of a fan. Um, the key thing about this movie, of course, was the mutants, or, or as they call it in the show, the mutant. So they, they, put, they put a bit of a, a bit of a gap there, but M U T A N T, mutant, and that was, of course, these dudes, uh, which was particularly groovy. And of course, the scientists with their really funky hairstyles getting everybody together. Russell Johnson, uh, the professor from Gilligan's Island, was in this and uh, had some really, really cool effects, especially when you got off the Metal Lunar and the place was being bombed to the shit house. I can't remember, Meteors or something, destroying the whole place. Great movie, all in colour, absolutely fantastic. And who didn't want an Interocitor? What can I say, eh? So uh, good stuff. There you go. Uh, yeah, I don't know. So Mystery Science Theatre, uh, yeah, they did a lot of this with a lot of shows. They would do their own voiceovers. I'm not a big fan of Mystery Science Theatre unless they're, hanging shit on really crappy movies that's fair cool but i can't understand why they would have done it for this particular film because this island earth was absolutely fantastic so there you go all right so that was number 19 which i'm gonna say oh didn't say that one coming how good is that all right so what do you reckon number 18 is now, I think this is voted by the fans at con 9 from outer space not by me by all these other people what do you reckon number 18 was even i don't know because i can't remember 18 was them oh my god get the ants out mate there you go. It's very, very funny. Even tonight, because of the hot weather, I've got ants in the shower. So uh, my other half's in there sort of exterminating them, even as we speak. Yeah, doing the whole Doctor Who reference. And um, big ass ants. How grouse was this film? And um, they go invade a city, or they like underneath the, uh, well, in the sewer tunnels and the city and all that. And they're huge, they're gigantic. And how grouse was this? And they actually made full size prop ants. So um, you can't knock that. Now, it's kind of funny that the, the movie was called Them. Because you're thinking, well, you surely were like Empire of the Ants was another movie. You could have gone with that because then could mean anything. But um, Ants was like really, really groovy. Look at this. Can you read that? A horror horde of crawl and crush giants crawling out of the earth for miles beneath catacombs. How could you knock a movie like that? Get a bit of them action happening. So uh, there you go. Classic movie. They're all classic, Mr. Elf. But I know exactly where you're coming from. So there you go. So. You think little one millimeter ants are not much of a threat, but when you get these big bastards, oh, unbelievable. It was very funny. Some people actually argued 
that if you get a real ant and you expand him out to like, you know, like 30, 40 feet long, he'll actually crush under his own weight because his legs won't be able to stand the mass. So whatever, technicalities, who cares about crap like that? So um, uh, Alpha said they won an award for the ants, as they should too, because it's like it's one thing to see a visual effect of a puppet or, um, you know, something that's been like, I think it was beginning of the end where they actually laid a photograph down of buildings and got the real real bugs to crawl over them and they filmed them and of course when they walked off the building into fresh air and you go oh it was just complete shit but when you actually build proper large props you got to respect and love that you know how groovies even if they couldn't move around much but you can just imagine sitting there going oh my god look at the size of this thing oh jesus christ scaring the living shit out of you so there you go good stuff uh yes it should have been a sequel those you do wonder don't you so very interesting naming uh, for the film. So it is very, very cool. Uh, only giant centipedes could spend more chills down my spine. Well, anything that's giant, because, you know, in this era, everything was giant. I mean, they made giant bloody things all over the place, you know, cockroaches and rabbits and bunnies and friggin' all sort of crap, you know, locusts, that sort of stuff. So large things were particularly groovy. Uh, this one, giant creatures. You're going to love this one, guy. I was surprised. Even I was personally surprised this made it to the list. Number 17. So this movie is actually better than this island earth and of course it's the giant claw mate how good is this a big ass vulture thing running around eating planes and destroying cities how grouse was this movie it is what was christy saying earlier about the cheese mate you got to get the cheese mate you get to bring the brie out in the swiss um gouda and whatever this movie was a hundred percent cheese right at the whole thing absolutely fantastic so you got to say this is uh, this is what made fifties movies so so cool, and there's no way you can watch this movie with a serious eye. And uh, you're right, Thomas. You got to laugh. That's all you can do. Not the claw, the claw. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, how good is that? And you're right, Mr. Rusky Babes. Jeff Morrow was in both movies, this one and this Island Earth. So it's a bit hard to take this seriously because when the actors made this film, they didn't see what the monster looked like, what the vulture thing looked like until afterwards, and they go, "Oh my god, that's a freaking shit house, man." <laughs> What the hell? How oh, Japanese cheese vibe about it. Now, the thing that is cool about this particular thing, and I really got to stress this out, right? Um, there are a lot of fans who love these movies and they want to like show their love and appreciation. Now, I went to this guy's place. This is Elf College's house, and he had built this, and I thought, oh, dude, you have just pushed so many buttons, and I had to include it here tonight. He actually built his own, out of clay, uh, and you can correct me if I got this right or wrong, giant claw model. How awesome is that? Handmade by Elf Collegiate. It's a one-off, and I saw this, and I go, that is so cool. Of all the things that anybody could make for anything, you've got to just, like, this magnificent. So, but that is grouse. Over the city and everything, you've got the plane down there, and, oh, you got to, yeah, woo, yeah, exactly right. Wooba, yeah, mate. All right, so we got to number 16. What do you think? Uh, what do you think number 16 was? Now, this one, it closed... I, it, even I was entitled to vote at this thing as well, the top five, and I thought, I've got to put a vote in for this. And other people voted for this as well, and I thought, I'm absolutely glad to. Fiend without a face. What an awesome <laughs> – they're all awesome. What an awesome movie this was. Brains running around, killing people. Now, of course, the thing with this movie is the brains are invisible, right, because they've got some kind of nuclear plant thing going on and all sort of crap and bullshit, and they're killing all these dudes. And, of course, you hear them. They've got this sound effect thing going on long before the idea of put, uh, having a sound being the introduction of a character before the character appears on screen. So you've got these brains, right? That's the, you know, the brain stalk there. You've got the brain there, and you've got the spine at the back there and all sort of bullshit, and it's going around. It's choking dudes, right? Oh, unbelievable. Then eventually, for whatever reason, I can't remember now, they become visible, right? Now, what makes this movie so particularly grouse is that when the heroes come in with their guns and they're seeing these brains and the brains are flying through the air and they're strangling these dudes, what do you do? You shoot them. And when you shoot them, they just piss out all this freaking brain shit. And it's going, it happens. It's in real time. It's absolutely awesome. So if you want to see a bit of gruesome in black and white with brain stuff just popping out everywhere, you can't knock film without a face. And I've got to say, I absolutely love it. And you'll see a brain sitting there and it's just going, all this stuff's just pouring out. And, and it does make that sound effect. <laughs> so how can you knock that seriously so uh yeah there we go um these are one of the best monsters ever yeah and it's scary shit because his brains mate the brains with like the killing dudes and you can't see them so uh you got to check that out so um and i agree rusky bays are very unusual they should make it that graphic in color it would probably get like rated r's and all sort of bizarre because it was in black and white you can get away with it but uh but everybody thought are oh, you killing these brain things mate make them I have all this stuff pouring out. It's absolutely spectacular. Don't forget, these things are invisible, 
All right, so they get around your neck, they strangle you with the spine. So even the predator would be struggling with that one. So there you go, two invisible. You had to just see a blank scene of just background, and you've got okay, an invisible predator with an invisible thing without a face, and they're going right at it, and no one can see anything, but you can hear it also. Very, very good stuff. God, I love it. All right. Down to number 15. Oh, my God, very, very exciting. Now, if you guys are all keeping count and going, oh, where are we going with this? How's it all going to play out? 15, I've got to say, when this one popped up, I thought, yep, yeah, fair call. I've got no problem with that at all. Um, so there you go. And, of course, it was the old Destination Moon. They went to such great lengths to try and make this as scientifically accurate as possible based on the information they had at the time. Uh, and, of course, you know, they're obviously a bit off in a few areas, but they went to a lot of trouble to try and make this the real deal. And this is when they were trying to make serious sci-fi. I mean, as we said a moment ago with, uh, like, the giant claw, you know, people laugh their heads off and it's all silly. But when, you know, with George Powell's movie here, they tried to do it seriously and uh, and do it properly and do it, put a fair bit of effort into the production design. Uh, this had Chesley Bonestell, who's a renowned artist of uh, space artwork. He did a lot of the background paintings for this. And uh, and his art is even today he's just cherished because this is long before we had uh, satellites um, visiting other moons and planets and whatever in the solar system. So we had no idea what they looked like. He just painted all these pictures and saying, well, this is what it could look like. And they were absolutely spectacular. Anyway, he did pictures for this, which is particularly groovy. Uh, ironically, even by today's standards, as of like last year, having the rocket land upright. Yeah, that's kind of a little bit like what the Elon Musk and those space galaxy dudes were doing, whatever they're called. So trying to get the rock to land up right. So when that when that happens, you go, hey, they saw that in Destination Moon. How group is that? Um, as it turned out, they did cock up one thing though, and they tried to this is where making something look good broke the scientific rules and I sort of found out. So if you look at the moon base here, they've got all these cracks in the in the ground, right? And of course that was put in to give this the set some scale, because otherwise it would have been boring as all hell. But if you've got all these cracks, that kind of represents that there was moisture uh, on the moon that dried up, and that's their mud cracks. And apparently, you know, even people like Chesley and all the rest of it will go, no, that's just not scientifically accurate at all. But they had to do it just to make it look interesting. And, in fact, what they did for the audience, for people out there who, you've got to remember, this is the 1950s, no one knows anything about the frigging moon or bloody rocket ships or that sort of shit. Uh, they did a Woody, Woody Woodpecker cartoon. Uh, now, this is actually in the movie itself where Woody Woodpecker explains what it is they're kind of trying to do with the ship fly off to the moon, land there, and all the rest of it. And it was designed for the audience, you know, to say, I don't get any of this crap. What the hell are you guys trying to do? And, of course, it was for that. So it was actually for the audience, and it was actually for, um, like, in, within the movie itself. And, uh, yeah, so Woody Woodpecker uh, became famous because of that. So how groovy is that? And the uh, <laughs> and the art on some kitchens. Yeah, I've got Chesley Bonestell inspired artwork on my kitchen bench, which is the vial painted for me a long time ago. So very, very groovy. And uh, Mr. Ann said, yeah, it's a Highland movie, which is particularly groovy. So everybody was trying really hard to make it scientifically accurate and uh, good on it too. But sometimes it's a tad on the boring side. So because all things being equal, uh, there's no excitement. There's really nothing happens. You just fly up, you land, there you go, you're here. Next up, we count down from number 14 to number 10.